I came to conclude that the next part is so significant to this journey. The best way to present it is to quote chapter 18 in its entirety, followed by the last two chapters of the book, written and added to over a seven-year period. This section is where the revelation enters the picture for myself, more than one. Now, if you've read the latest revision that's supplied, you might notice that I skip a small but significant section towards the end of chapter 18. That's because here we're following the journey, not the book, which we go way beyond. There's a reference to a chaplain at Anglia Ruskin University. I went to see him while I was doing my bachelor's degree. I wanted to discuss the journey with someone. I think I freaked him out. He threw me out of his office and called this the devil's work. Chapter 18 There are two main issues that I actually wanted to cover in these more recent revisions. The first is that of the experience of writing this book, the spiritual and religious aspects of it, and the footprints on Catopurgo Bay. I want to revisit the experience and present it with a space of years, reflecting the changes within myself, as I make this and later revisions, and with consideration to the man I was immediately before the book. What I never planned for was the developments that the years would bring, cementing the beliefs I held not through scripture, but science and experience, as this journey draws towards its inevitable conclusion. I never expected to take back much of what I wrote. The memory of the man I was may be faded, but far more lucid and clear is the memory of what I saw on Catopurgo Bay Beach. When I think of the Lamb of God bit, as bizarre as it may seem, I cannot escape the conclusion I came to, and I know that my sanity and my persistence on this matter rests on the certainty of what I saw on the beach that November morning so many years ago. What I saw was impossible, and, as a consequence, possibilities I could never have comprehended at that time would soon unravel. If, though, as I like to imagine, Aphrodite danced in a decrease-inspiring inspiring circle to the centre where she stood on her toes and reached for the sky to which she disappeared, it was not for Cyprus alone. I don't think of myself as a biblical apocalyptic figure. I might have got carried away, as I have at times, especially after a probation service wound me up. I take none of that back. But I think of myself as someone that, through their life experiences, this book, the journey it describes, and the footprints, found themselves with a destiny from which I can neither escape nor felt I can peacefully move on from, only with. So I continued not knowing where this was leading, but knowing it's the only way for a peaceful resolution for myself, despite any concerns. Something I have learnt is that people are expecting different things of this particular biblical figure. Some, I'm sure, expect Christ to come riding a cloud, striking down enemies with thunderbolts and raising the dead on the way, all on primetime TV, and they aren't going to accept anything less. Many of our disappointments in life come from our own expectations. I like to think of the experience in personal terms. I've had an incredible journey through life, writing and living this book, and I saw a miracle along the way, and a beautiful one to myself. But isn't life itself a beautiful miracle? Or it would be, if it wasn't squandered so. Despite the carnage in the world today, and that to come, this experience gives me optimism for the future and the biggest change in how I perceive what I went through has been in my attempts to separate it from the religious ideology that, one could argue, gave the journey its greater significance. Although the universal force may be cast in some form of judgment, I allowed myself to get carried away, as I have at times, but that's to be understood, I think. Exploring the similarities between my own experiences and that which is written in Revelation concerning the Lamb critically there's more than enough to develop a very strong argument for, and then there's the footprints. This is my reality, and to deny it would, I know with my counselling training, be detrimental to my psychological and emotional well-being. I am not the same person I was when I wrote this book, chapters 1 to 15. Then I was physically very sick, but spiritually I'd been in preparation for my own past in many years. People seem surprised when I tell them that life was easier back then. 
I just had myself to consider in the present, no long or mid-term plans due to a short life expectancy, a generous government allowance for which I am thankful, and an ability to sit in silence alone for many hours and still feel love for all those around me, and in turn, myself. As I sit here writing this, in the present, I don't feel a patch on the man that knelt in the sand with a knife to his throat. I could fly to Rome for a long weekend or visit my Swiss junkie friend. It's a funny life that I must live. Some call it a curse. I call it a gift. It's the moments that matter for here and for now, but consider your future, for soon it draws down. But it's not to be feared, that future so near. When the curtain is drawn, all becomes clear. I set my sights high, I reach for the stars. I try for perfection. It's fun, but it's hard. I know if I trip, the fall will be great. I smile. I'll admit, I made a mistake. It's a funny life that I must live. With eagles I fly, and fell peacocks I live. I should have prepared you for that. It's a funny life. I wrote it in 1998, and I didn't like being with people much. I was stunned when I read Revelation during the writing of chapter 15. After the experiences I'd been through and the footprints in the sand, and the impossibility of them, it had, with a great degree of certainty, made sense that this was guided by a universal force with physical powers, i.e. God. It made sense of a journey then, and it makes just as much sense now, as absurd as it may seem. Back then, just after reading Revelation, I was driving around on some errands, looking up through the windscreen in awe. I needn't have looked anywhere. But I remember saying slowly, it was you, all the time, it was you. And only through my acceptance of that do I feel whole again, only when I embrace my whole being as according to my life experience as I know it, and in turn, I feel so much more love. The beauty of that is only tarnished by the expectations of the biblical individual involved. I cannot fit this into any mainstream religious ideology, as I got here my own way. I don't sit around reading Revelation, haven't read it since then, except to reproduce chapter 5 here in chapter 16. I just tend to Google specific points if I'm curious, but I know the connections are there from my original examination. It's because of the footprints I don't need to look again. Although, as I tidy this up for the sixth revision, I have read more, and it was best I never went back to it after my initial examination of the details. It's a lot for any person to take on. It threw me for a few days, but I can't stop now. I have to see this through and trust my faith repaid. Before I originally started this section for the third revision, I had a conversation with a friend I had recently made who said that he'd met a few people that, like myself, had been brought to the conclusion that they were the lamb from the book of Revelation. I was very intrigued and wanted to know more, and he told me that they were each sectioned at one time or another because of these beliefs. I smiled when he told me that. Their written evidence couldn't have been that persuasive, and they obviously weren't given a sign, such as the footprints, to hold them. Nothing's going to change for me, except for the way I perceive the experience, and considering I am unable to take back what I believe, the easiest place for myself to find refuge might have been within the religious explanation, but I haven't wished to do this, not for a long time. And now, I don't feel I need to. One of the reasons I think I upset the chaplain at Anglia Ruskin is because I told him that I believe that all religions pervert and distort the idea of God. I regard the time we're living in as being a key period in our development as a race. I regard established religious ideology mainly because of the differing interpretations and the rules that come with them as restrictive in gaining an understanding of the universal force we term as God. The prophets of past may have been sent to guide us on our path, but I know that there is more to the universe than we can presently comprehend, and I also think that their path can be and has been distorted and manipulated. Alex Romain succinctly describes this distortion in the intro to his book Direct Democracy and the Nature of God. What we think God wants from us stems from our perception of the nature of God, and so, 
if a religious perception of the nature of God is inaccurate, and if most people on this planet follow a religion, this explains how the way that we live as God-fearing humans is damaging to all life on this planet, before he suggests certain premises that are difficult to argue against. If, as the religion state, God existed before everything, then God has no needs. If God has no needs, then God is vulnerable to nothing. If God is vulnerable to nothing, then God can't be threatened. If God can't be threatened by anything, then God has no purpose for laws. If God has no purpose for laws, then we have free will. If we have free will, then there is no punishment. If there is no punishment, then there is no hell. If there is no hell, then there is no evil or devil. This doesn't of course offer us an understanding of the nature of God, and further on Alex writes that he believes in heaven. This is a matter we will return to, but at this time I did not, in any form. Regardless of what any book may say, I think heaven, as a place where we as individuals might dwell after death, was contrived by us to reassure ourselves. I believe in life. I think I've always believed in life. And I used to make sense of the idea of a universal force or God by believing that we are not yet able to comprehend the true nature of this natural force. But I believe from my own experience that God, or Mother Nature, as I like to think of her, has a loving heart. One of my counselling tutors gave me the Kabbalah to read, and although I couldn't agree with one particular aspect of it, relating to karma and life knocking you on the head because of previous sins in former lives, I related strongly to the idea of a human soul mirroring the divine. I told my wife recently that I think love is the solution to all our problems, both personally and globally. I mean genuine love for one and all. There is without doubt a power to love, compassion, forgiveness and understanding that far outweigh any benefits that might be derived from fear, ignorance and resentment. When we're free internally of negative emotions such as jealousy, resentment and fear, and our hearts full of love and compassion, especially when there's that special spark between oneself and a significant other, our guard comes down, we're open. And it's been at times such as these that I've felt closer to the universal love that I think constitutes a part of what we term God. If you throw in a couple of consecutive sleepless nights, these have been the conditions under which I experience such things as the gathering and other emotional stroke spiritual aspects of this journey. I do tend to veer towards the idea of reincarnation now more than ever, based on certain experiences and understandings developed more recently. But ultimately, we don't know for certain. Given the journey and where it's led me, I could get more currency out of saying that I do know for certain what happens after we pass but then I'd be deceiving you. If I speak personally, what I have nearly always believed, with some certainty, is that the I, one way or another, will, after my passing, become a part of a greater whole. For myself and from a subjective perspective, death does not exist. And more recently I've been thrilled to discover that this concept has support in the science of biocentrism, which pursues the idea that biology is primary, life created for universe, Reading Robert Lanz's book on the subject was as if all the pieces of a complex puzzle seemed to merge together. One of the problems I'd been having since coming to my conclusion way back in 1999 and after removing the religious aspect was in my attempt to make some sense of the apocalypse and the judgement including the motivation and the actual workings of the force or forces involved. It's okay having faith but what when your belief drawn from your experiences means that you have to make a commitment on that faith. It must beg the question, have I interpreted those experiences correctly? My experiences led me to believe that we are each about to be judged, individually, as according to Revelation. How do you bring some form of logic to that based on possibilities and reason? That's what biocentrism initiated within myself and towards my experience, and consciousness seems to be the key, the only place and form our soul could possibly dwell. While the main premise of biocentrism is that biology, life, is primary and existed before the universe, it can only be in terms of consciousness. Our own consciousness, as Lanza points out, is a font of neuroelectrical energy. 
It's a mystery to science how it's formed, and it's possibly a miss of science to not ask the question more often, what happens to this energy after our physical body dies? One of the fixed rules of physics is that energy cannot be destroyed nor created. It can only change form. Without actually expressing it, Lanza has one question in the very nature of God, the sum of all consciousness, perhaps? More recently, research has confirmed the existence and reality of quantum entanglement, which I first came across in Lanza's work. Quantum entanglement determines that particles that derive from the same source maintain an instantaneous connection, no matter how far apart, and the consequences of this understanding completely change the way we perceive our planet, our universe, and ourselves. It not only adds great weight to the idea that we all maintain a connection to each other, but I think it also lays down the necessary foundation that would be required for universal consciousness, more commonly referred to as God, to exist in practice. I'm not that advanced with my math, but scientists say that the mathematics behind quantum entanglement is simply beautiful to be old. While there's another developing branch of science called panpsychism, regarding which a paper has recently been published, where the author Gregory Metloff hypothesizes that a proto-consciousness field could extend throughout all space. In basic terms, there's a scientific basis supporting the idea that the entire cosmos could be self-aware, through the observation of stars across the universe, and the phenomena of Perigeno's discontinuity. If I've understood the paper correctly, there's a belief that stars organise themselves in regards to positioning, which could only adequately be explained through universal awareness. In addition, and after the sixth revision was published, an unknown fifth universal force has been identified through the Hadro Collider at CERN. So, this is me thinking to myself, if I use the train system as an analogy for universal consciousness, or God if you like, with the idea of a train being God, and at every station, and every point, all at the same time, then doesn't quantum entanglement lay the foundations for that system? Make it possible. Matloff's experiments might prove to ourselves that it's likely the train exists, as does for recent understandings gained of the Hadro Collider at CERN. All that would be left then would be to understand the nature that drives or motivates the train. And maybe, just maybe, that's where this book, this journey, might come into the picture. This recently gained understanding has been a game changer for myself, and it's within these areas where my experiences and the idea of an apocalyptical type event where we're individually judged make much greater sense on consideration. Now the piece is fit for myself. What follows for the next couple of pages are my thoughts and considerations as a consequence of this understanding of the universe, theorising. This journey has led me to an extremely bizarre place, where relevant aspects of what many consider religious prophecy, i.e. revelation, has, through the journey I've taken, logged here in this text, found an expression in these modern times at a crucial and interesting stage that converges with our latest understanding of ourselves and the universe. I lean away from the idea of some form of judgement based on retribution, because it's nature we're talking about, and I think it's more likely to be related to our state of being. Let's discuss. Well, I will for now. What do we know about life? It corrupts was the answer I came to. Universal consciousness, God, Mother Nature, Allah, call him, it, she, what you will, we can assume is pure. And purity is impossible to maintain for any substance if it is continually corrupted. At this point, I'm going to define what I mean by corruption, as it has been a question asked. Before I started writing this book, way back in 1998, when I had full-blown AIDS, was suffering from MAI and a very short life expectancy. I told one or two people that I thought we should all be like gods unto ourselves, and I'd get a strange look before telling them that I meant the love, the compassion that we're all capable of, adding, who else would God want to be with? I stopped that line of conversation when I wrote the book, but I do think I need to define more clearly what I mean by corrupted and I guess at this stage I'd have to say that it's any diversion from that state of being in relation to that love and compassion for all and everything, self-included. Or, maybe I'm wrong, and it is the ultimate act of universal karma, or maybe, and quite possibly, 
both ideas equate to each other. But my feeling is nature acts out of necessity, not revenge. So let's go back a bit. What if universal consciousness was responsible for the Big Bang? Scientifically, it's not impossible. It's just not proven. What if consciousness in living creatures, ourselves included, derives from a one universal consciousness? Not only would that still be within the realms of possibility, regardless of how incredible it may seem, but what makes reincarnation more logical for myself now, considering it in light of where we're led, is the idea of separation, quarantine of sorts, from the universal consciousness. Life corrupts. Considering the circumstances under which we're discussing it, perhaps it's a case that the individual corrupted consciousness would not and could not automatically be allowed to reunite with the universal consciousness. Nothing can remain pure when it's constantly being corrupted. Here fits for myself at least the idea of reincarnation holding a dual function, experience for the individual involved and as a safety mechanism for universal consciousness, a form of quarantine. But taking this back to the beginning, what would be the purpose? For what reason would universal consciousness create the universe? What is it that we, most of us at least, if not all of us, find attractive? Building, creating, life itself would become the primary purpose, and we'd be a consequence of that. For what would be the best way to experience what it is that's created? Through taking an active role in that life, being a biological part of that existence, to feel the warm sun on our skin, the breeze in our face, the taste of a fine wine, the smell of jasmine in the air, the feel and touch of a loved one, the beauty of a sunset or the sunrise, and of course, the joy of love. So an individual consciousness forms in the fetus stage, which enables that experience. This creation or formation of consciousness towards the end of the first trimester and the beginning of the second is supported both through modern science and Buddhist ideology, but it serves no known biological function. This revolving pattern of life and rebirth to protect the universal consciousness would ultimately lead to problems, as our experience of a global situation reflects. To be at one again would require a level of purity that's acceptable to the whole, and, I think at some point, soon or later, we must be at one again, while the corruption must be discarded or neutralised in some way. This takes the idea of an individual personal judgement from the realm of religious retribution to that of natural requirement and necessity. Now I dig it. Now it makes sense. Then this point in time would be, as I concluded over 12 years ago, to help us understand the true nature of ourselves. So following on from the reincarnation bit, it makes sense to believe our consciousness carries the essence of what and who we are and there's strong anecdotal evidence discovered with the help of hypnosis to suggest that memories of where we've been are carried. But for many, there's more an instinctive feeling, similar to our sixth sense or intuition. Richard Bach is a clear example of this intuitive theory, which is displayed through his writing with his wonderful series of books, for which I am eternally thankful. Robert Lanza theorises that life is primary and existed before the birth of the universe, while Bach directs that same theory to the individual, the I, the you. But one can find numerous other examples of this spiritual expression in various different art forms, from music to paintings. We inhabit these bodies, live the lives we're born into, which in turn are moulded by our genes, our parents, and the environment into which we emerge, be it war, poverty, or the comfort of wealth. But the essence of our existence remains the same, our consciousness, and if there's anything to these theories, then we have to assume that consciousness is the universal constant. The only dominant theory we have of consciousness is that it is associated with complexity, with a system's ability to act upon its own state and determine its own fate. Christoph Koch of the Allen Institute for Brain Science. Just as there is no definitive proof of the existence of universal consciousness as yet, so too is there no definitive proof otherwise. But if you examine supporting and surrounding evidence, then it all concurs with the possibility that this, our path, has been guided. 
One example would be the precise requirements needed for a Big Bang event to successfully develop into the universally creative force that it has. What if the explosion was always determined to create life, because it was born of life, as I think Lanza infers? Some might argue that I'm misquoting him, but as Einstein came to conclude, God doesn't play dice with the universe. Despite my attempts to rationalise my experience, to bring some form of logic to it, I'm not forgetting the religious connections, an acknowledgement of the loving loyal and the faithful, regardless of creed or persuasion. I think they have all held a relevance on this journey, little steps on our passage of understanding ourselves. There can only be one universal consciousness, but I think a part of it resides within us all. I'm going to quote Einstein again, because I like what he wrote, and I like that I'm using what is still one of the greatest scientific minds of our time, as opposed to vague religious scriptures. A human being is part of a whole called bias universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feeling as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. When I think of our existence in terms of my present understanding, the universe seems such an incredible place that we are bound to it in more ways than we can imagine. And to consider that we're in the process of destroying our own planet, something so precious becomes more than a little infuriating. But we must have known we'd be here. And if there is a basis for this understanding of our existence, then we must have all been there at the beginning. I would argue that gives each and every one of us an equal say over what happens to our planet as a whole, over and beyond that of any corporation or government. No government or corporation were there at the beginning. That's a fact we know for sure. The rest is quite possible, as incredible as it may seem. Indeed, this concept changes how one might think about the whole of life, our planet, our universe, ourselves. What we are brought up to think of as being separate to our physical being, we are bound to on a much deeper, profound level. Professor Brian Cox said in his enthralling series, Forces of Nature, Life is just a temporary home for the immortal elements that make up the universe. Well, why not for consciousness, our consciousness included? Don't tell me it's not possible, because I know it is, now more than ever. Scientists would not even be researching the idea of universal consciousness if it had been deemed physically impossible, and quantum entanglement changes everything. And as a consequence, I believe our potential as a race is incredible, to say the least. I don't think, as one might say, that God loved us so he gave us the earth. I think it's more a case that we were born of love, and that's the primary quality that each of us individually need to strengthen and secure our future prosperity and success as a global and universal community. Let's make that a bit clearer. Love of money, power or big yachts will not help you, especially at this time. Love of your fellow human, regardless of creed, colour, status or sexual orientation, nature and our Mother Earth, yourself, and more importantly, the expression of that love, are the qualities I think we might find more useful at this present time, and forever on. We find that love as a community, and the rest for compassion, for forgiveness, for prosperity, will all follow naturally. But let's not forget the significance of truth in this matter, honestly to yourself, and others. I wrote to the Serbian Archbishop way back in 2007, over the loss of Kosovo, but at the end of a letter, which was never sent including this finishing line, I wrote something I never forgot. Ultimately, we're all pawns in the mind of God. That always troubled me. I mean really troubled me. Till now. But I think I understand. Maybe we need to advance before we can fly free. My own lengthy inquiry, the understandings reached these recent months for this sixth revision, and my developed beliefs have stemmed from the desire to solve a riddle for why and how could life lead me in a way that led me where it did. 
and also explains those footprints. What I never expected was that science itself would most enable that understanding and empower me further as I move toward what I know must be the conclusion of this book, one way or the other. In December 2018, I read through parts of the book and realised it was embarrassingly outdated. At the time, I'd just discovered my wife was pregnant, and although she would later miscarry, I knew that if I was going to be a father, as I hoped, then I wanted this out of the way, for a while at least. I decided to throw out a quick revision for the time being, so I was happy with how it read, and dated it 28th December 2018, and marked it down as a sixth revision, not putting too much thought into it. While I was in the process of doing this, or very soon after, my thoughts were drawn back to when I was first brought to my conclusion in 1999, and the curiosity surrounding the seven seals. These seven seals, which are written of in Revelation, each initiate a stage of the apocalypse. From the release of the four horsemen with the first four seals, to the seventh seal, during which the final, ultimate stage occurs. If one knew what they were, then one would have an idea of any time scale, and, as I believed then and now, it was clearly written that I opened them. I thought I should know what they were, if not then, at some point in the future. All the other stuff in Revelation about the number of a beast and he who has wisdom didn't matter to me, but the seals, they were explicitly opened by the Lamb, so I thought I should know. I named the publisher under which this book was first published and every private publication since as Sacred Seal Publications, as I couldn't think of any other name and I'd been considering them a lot at the time. So by February, as well as theorising on the universal consciousness aspect, I found myself considering whether each revision of this book indicated a seal opened from the first one back in 1999. At this point, I thought my most recent revision was actually of six and the fifth revision was dated 2015. So I did a quick internet search for that year and the fifth seal of the apocalypse, and it returned a story of 38 Eritrean priests killed by Daesh, and I settled for that initially, until I put greater thought into my revisions and sought out the evidence by actually reviewing past published works before realising, amongst other things, that what I'd counted in my mind as three revisions before 2008 was really one. It was the version for the website on which it was once available, which had gone live by the time I was given books out in Cyprus. I counted proofreading as revision, which it's not, and it was at this time that the later chapters were initiated as notes under the heading afterward, but it would never be published, not even on the website, until the author house edition, which then counted as the second revision. I'd also thought that the 2015 and 2017 prints were exactly the same, as the latter was released through the then recent Amazon print service, but they weren't. There were significant changes, and that was another revision, which in turn meant what I thought was the sixth revision was in fact really the fifth. The publication date for that revision was set for 28th December 2018, and a few alterations were made in January and February. It was after that the New Zealand mosque massacres occurred, and by April, after more research and verification, I was confident that I'd recently published the fifth revision, and I uploaded the newly amended details marking that print as the fifth revision to Amazon Publications on Easter Sunday as I sat at home alone. Just as I finished uploading, I looked up at the TV and saw the first pictures of the Sri Lankan church bombings coming through and a statue of Christ, his cheeks splattered with the blood of a martyred. I saw under the altar souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Yes, I've been peeking again. It was a chilling moment. It felt like a personal message with the timing of everything. And again, I found myself in awe, and my stomach turns when I think of it. It reminds me of a deal I made with a probation officer, after which I lost my closest friend. I have always believed in this, but never fully committed myself, not in my entirety. I've had a part of me holding back, not because I don't believe in it, but because I have enough of my wits about me to know that I cannot determine where this is going. And it's been without a plan, without a real direction. And now, do we, or at least I, have a possible timeline? For the first time I can see a direction, 
for the first time I can see how this might all actually work out. And, I think, the place of this book in the scheme of things. So if this is all real, as I can only believe, due to my own experiences, and that last revision was really linked to the fifth seal, then perhaps this revision heralds the opening of the sixth seal in the lead up to the seventh seal, which initiates a further series of apocalyptic events during which the bottomless pit is said to be opened. I couldn't help thinking like a cosmic waste bin. But we'll get to that. Either way, this feels good for me. One way or the other, we'll know soon. Or I will, at least. As for myself, I just made what I consider my biggest breakthrough in turning what many people perceive as the ultimate act of religious retribution to one of natural necessity. And as coincidental as it may seem, with regards to my present understanding of where we stand in relation to the opening of the seals, it made so much more sense. I don't presume to have it all figured out, but I do believe I'm on the right path, and that, if I have one at all, is my ultimate purpose, to find that right path. I don't, and have never claimed to be a prophet or messianic figure. A messenger, perhaps. A guide I will accept, as according to the experiences that have led me here, as this message, this journey, feels near completion. I've returned to write this section because I did peak in Revelation further than I might normally have. It was after the sixth seal being opened. I read on to the numbers being marked for, let's call it salvation for now, for this argument's sake, and I was dumbstruck. Let's just say I found the numbers somewhat small and the diversity very limited. I didn't like what I read. I did not like it at all. It troubled me, and I found myself very distant for a few days while I fought it over. I couldn't get out of what I saw as my role in this, so I did the only thing I could. I went back to that book, and read on a bit further, to be met by surprise, relief, and a sense of responsibility I have never felt in this. It's written that a great multitude, of every kind, of every nation appear, apparently, viz of a great tribulation that have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. It was a wise move for me not to return to Revelation after my initial examination, and that has been confirmed by further reading. I still won't read it all through again, not because I don't believe or lost faith, but because I remember enough. Chapter 5 is a shoe fit, and I have the footprints, and they were, are, real. Seems so much within it that I don't like. But these matters are all unrelated and thereby irrelevant in relation to my own journey, despite which, and my faith, it is not blind. I constantly question, and I really am somewhat incredulous of this, but I can't stop what I'm doing. I've experienced the ending. But I think if you're good of heart, loving, compassionate, honest, and open-minded, then that's enough. But these are not my parameters. If this is real, then no one will truly know till they pass, myself included. I have never claimed to know everything or have any powers in relation to what happens. However, as for those awaiting the so-called rapture through which individuals believe they will be plucked to safety to watch events alongside Jesus Christ in the comfort of their own self-righteousness, I really don't think that's going to happen. And personally, I am happier and feel more comfortable seeing through whatever comes within my own community. The tribulation element has put a burden of responsibility on me that I've never felt before. As you may gather from reading other parts, including the closing chapter, this is my journey. It's how I've always perceived it. But it's not just my journey. This is yours as well. Ours. So this is myself responding to that burden of responsibility. I spoke to a friend recently. He seemed troubled. And when we spoke about this, as he'd read a much earlier revision, he told me of his reticence to accept my version of the footprints, maybe because I missed something, as he knows, I wouldn't lie, or I like to think he knows. He has thrown up the possibility that she swam in, and went where was my response. That felt okay for me, because it's the one part of this that I am most certain about. There is no room for misinterpretation. I will never forget as my eyes first gazed upon her centre prints where she stood on her toes, despite the strange nature of them to start with, it was the first real what the moment. What struck me most was the cliff lines formed by her dorsal, the top part of her foot, so compact, so straight, 
not a trace of disturbance. I remember peering forward to look further into the holes her feet had made for loose sand. I saw none. The only physical possibility I could imagine then was that she had helped getting out, and I was certain I'd see their footprints as I raised my head further for the first time. There were none. Just mine and hers. That was a really big what the moment. But still I thought I could work them out. I would soon realise it was useless. I just never saw the point in them. At that time, my thoughts were, just as I described in the book, if they were important, then I saw them. I know. But I'm not going to break my balls trying to convince others. I simply don't feel the need to. I don't need to. Next time you're near a sandpit or a beach, try walking barefoot or otherwise to the centre. Stand on your toes as you reach high and then get out leaving no disturbance of your original prints or any trace of your preceding movements and without a vertical lift of some sort. I would not be writing this today if I were not so certain of what I saw. I left no room for error in my examination. It had started to panic me, which is why I cursed, but it was poetic to say the least. There was a time I gave this book credit as officially announcing the apocalypse. I have said I've got carried away at times. But this is what it is, a journey. If the reality of this all rests on the genuine nature of those footprints, then it really is she that announces the apocalypse with her dance. That's sublime to myself. As beautiful as God putting the sword in the hand of a child to bring us here. It's because of those footprints I look forward with a sense of intrepid excitement. The possibilities... I have questioned what I've been doing many times, but I've stood my ground every step of the way, not only because of those footprints and the course this book took, chapters 1 to 15, but a lifetime of events and, on occasions, what I term intuitive responses to questions asked. Around the same time as I asked of God regarding the horseman as a young child, I also considered that if we had God to thank for everything, our lives, our planet, then I wanted to serve, but hell, all the serving institutions were, are, institutions, with their own ideas of how to serve, their own rules, their own ideas of God, and the intuitive response was, you will know when God needs you. How could I, having lived the life I have, betray my truth, and quite possibly God? Even that term seems antiquated now, but the sentiment remains the same. I can rationalise through science, but not betray, and science has, unexpectedly, been extremely helpful on this journey. But if you think logically, so it should. It is, after all, the study of nature. People know what I've been saying. The press, the legal establishment here in the UK, politicians, the Church, Eastern Orthodox, Catholic, Church of England, and I can understand their response. I am not the sort to put a sandwich board on and parade for streets, but ignorance is no excuse when it was a choice that was taken. For those Christians that are still expecting Christ himself, sorry, I really don't think he's going to make it. I do have a personal message for you, though. Don't shoot the messenger. And nothing makes a message. The main core of the message that has been handed down through your religious tradition less relevant. I don't get any great thrill out of what I've been doing or saying. If I think too much about it, I'd be overwhelmed. But I have loved the journey. I do think it's going to end well, but I'm concerned for myself, for all of us, in the present and the near future, while feeling excited for the possibilities of the same time. For I, Dimitri Jordan, will only live one lifetime. My consciousness, my essence, my soul will never die, nor will yours. That is my belief. Some of you might prefer otherwise, but I think I've been where you're going, unless I've been misled, of course. Right in vet brought a smile to my face. We'll see. And so will you. At this point, I want to get two things out of the way. I was once accused of being narcissistic by a Lambeth probation officer who I saw for the 1999 court case. I just shook my head because I knew he couldn't understand. I've already told my wife when I pass I'd like my body to have an ecological burial. No headstone. No markers are allowed. A tree I'd like. Pear peach even. Ultimately, I care less about myself than I do about my journey. And within that, I mean, my name is not important.
With regards to any possible accusations that I'm doing this for money, I'll be happy if this book never sells. I mean, really. But if it does, then I'll pledge those profits to charity and worthy causes. Take the letter as you wish. I don't care. But if you're even considering such accusations, you're desperate. No one could or would write such a book as this for money. It happened not by design, but fate, destiny. And I don't doubt that it might be considered dangerous by some, but I am not afraid. I have no room for it. DRM is off on the e-book. It can be shared freely, and I encourage this. This journey, this particular book, has been a matter of conscience for myself, and it's consumed my life for the better part of 20 years, and only God knows for how much longer. Okay, so I might have come to some form of reasoning and an idea, no matter how loose, of some of the workings of this, but I can't stop considering the how. We think in our pursuit of knowledge and developing an understanding of the world around us, observation, logic and reason. Quantum physics has turned much of that logic on its head, and perhaps it is our senses, our feelings, our intuition we also need to explore to understand aspects of our universe, other parts of ourselves. Wouldn't this also require a clear conscience? Can you relate like that while you're bogged down with a weight of lies, guilt, resentment, fear, greed, and the other negative elements that consume many? I found myself considering great universal questions from two points of confirmation for myself. The universe or universal consciousness is not as passive as many believe, and I was led to revelation as I was, leading me to believe in a form of judgment for whatever reason. I don't think of revelation as a religious book. In fact, from my experience, its fulfilment brings to an end the authority of all religions over our relationship with God, the universe, and ourselves. Nikola Tesla wrote, If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. That makes so much sense in relation to this journey. Doesn't love hold its own unique, universal signature? These are my considerations as I sit here, put in the sixth revision for its final smoothing down, so to speak. It feels whole now, almost whole. I've held back one or two bits, but it feels whole. Maybe I've been duped, big time, by life, fate. But I see the footprints, clear as ever. And that would still be okay for me. I will accept it. Maybe, despite the challenges to come in the near future, we're at the dawn of an amazing, incredible, new era. And there's more to life and love than we ever imagined.